Ah, uh, Apple. The poster boy of the smartphone. The company built from the ground by one of the most influential people of the 20th and 21st century. Even if you're not a fan of their products, you can most certainly respect how the company led by Steve Jobs rose above all else to become the first company in the history of the world to reach a $1 trillion valuation. Whether you're interested in Apple as a potential shareholder or you just want to know more about the company's journey to success, you will find what you're looking for in this video. This video will be broken down into three sections. We're gonna start off with the history of Apple, then we're gonna have a look at the key factors to its success, and finally, we're gonna have a look at its current and future valuation. So let's first go back to 1976 where college dropouts Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak founded Apple Computers, a company that would change the way people thought about computers forever. In 1978, they were already generating a whopping $8 million in revenue from the sales of their Apple I and II computers, and their rapid growth didn't stop there. By 1980, the year they went public on the New York Stock Exchange, they were generating over $100 million in revenue. And while you might be blown away by that, let's fast forward to 2018, where the company has generated over $255 billion in the last 12 months, 56 billion of that, which is after tax profit. There are so many milestones along Apple's journey, but I just wanted to mention a few notable ones. In 1985, the sales of Apple's Macintosh began to fall away, and Jobs plotted to have John Scully, the chief executive at the time, removed. However, his plan fails and results in Jobs being stripped of all his responsibilities and ultimately resigning. Jobs returned to Apple in 1993, and by 2001, Jobs unveiled the first iPod, changing the way that people listen to music forever. Then in 2007, Jobs unveiled the first smartphone, the iPhone, changing the way that people communicated forever. There's a bit of a trend here, can't you tell? but their product innovation wasn't the only thing that led to their massive success on a trillion dollar scale. So let's talk about Apple's key factors to success. And I've broken this section down into two major parts. The first factor to Apple's success was their ability to build a wide economic moat. An economic moat is exactly what it sounds like. It's a strong long-term competitive advantage that stopped mediocre competition from taking its market share. And Apple had more than one of these. Their first was their strong branding moat, which they built by creating high-end exclusive products with software that you could only use on their devices. Their products objectively had the purest designs and they were the most expensive on the market, which created the illusion of exclusivity, of being a part of something when you owned Apple products. And that ultimately led to the die-hard Apple fan base that you see today. People who, without hesitation, will go out and buy the latest and greatest Apple products, even though the one in their hand is more or less the same thing. And then Apple has what's called a switching mode. They made it difficult for you to switch brands once you had bought a few of their products. You may have heard the term Apple ecosystem, and it essentially refers to the compatibility between Apple devices, which makes common tasks feel effortless. It made tasks between devices feel so effortless that you would be giving up a substantial aid if you were to switch brands. It also meant that if you wanted to get access to all of Apple's features on their software, you really needed to own multiple Apple devices, their phone, their laptop, their Apple TV. Now let's look at the company's second factor to success, having a highly competent management team. Now a competent management can be assessed over two dimensions. The first is the management's team to manage debt, and relatively speaking, they haven't done an overwhelmingly good job. They have a current ratio of 1.28 and a debt to equity ratio of 1.8, which are both good, but nothing outstanding. But remember, we look at management competence over two dimensions. The second being the ability of the company to effectively invest capital within the business. And Apple has done this exceptionally well. Over the past five years, they've managed to maintain a return on invested capital of about 25%, which is vastly stronger than the 16% average for the top 100 firms in the United States. Now that all sounds great, but if you wanna become an Apple shareholder and share in their gigantic profits, we need to understand what their current and future value is. How much are they worth today? And how much will they be worth in 10 years time? 
In this table, I've taken the four main metrics that are important to look at when investing in businesses, that being the sales or revenue, the earnings per share, the equity and the free cash flow. And I've seen what average return they've gotten on each of these aspects over the past 10 years. And as you can see, over the very long term, over a seven year average or a nine year average, their performance has been outstanding. However, this was mainly due to the rise of such an innovative product as the iPhone. And as you can see, over the recent times, growth has been considerably slowed. Looking at the table, we can see that growth in the areas of sales, earnings per share and equity have sort of become more consistently around the 5 to 10% range. So if we're going to be projecting the growth of Apple over the next 10 years, we would be safest to use a rate somewhere between 5 and 15%. Now that we've seen how they've performed in the past, let's use that to predict how they're going to perform in the future and what return we can expect to get from Apple. What you're looking at right now is what I call the value matrix. And what it does is it takes a variety of growth rates, as you can see on the left, from 5% to 15%. And across the top, it takes a variety of PE ratios, how much the market values a company in 10 years time. And in the middle, we can see in the top table, what return we can expect to get each and every year, depending on the growth and the PE ratio. And in the bottom table, it tells us what stock price Apple will be at, depending on their growth and PE ratio. So at the current time, the growth prospects for Apple aren't great. As we saw on the other table, they're most likely going to do somewhere between 5 and 10% per year, which means that we're probably going to see a return on our investment somewhere between 0% and 8% in terms of capital gains. But capital gains isn't the only way we make money in a stock. We also make money when they pay out a dividend and Apple currently pays a 1.32% dividend. So if you're investing at the current stock price, you can see that you would probably expect to make about 8%. However, I want to use the matrix to show you what happens if the stock price was to fall 50%. If the stock price fell 50%, you can now see that the expected return is over 15%, which is an amazing growth for a company that is so stable. Essentially, what I'm suggesting here is that we wait for some sort of market correction in order to invest in Apple. Wait for the market to have a six month or one year period of negative returns, see those stock prices fall down 40, 50%, and then start to invest in companies like Apple. In conclusion, I will say that while the opportunity for massive stock market returns through Apple is small, the company's foundations are solid and if bought at the right price, you can expect to make a modest return over the long term. This video took me a long time to put together, so if you enjoyed it, please consider becoming a subscriber. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments section below, but for now, I'll see you in the next one.